If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome to this brand new series on biostatistics. This subject is notorious for being difficult to learn and even more challenging to remember when it comes time to take that exam. So my goal with this video series is to simplify the concepts as much as possible and to give you memory tips and clinical examples to really help solidify the abstract concepts that we review. As always, I'm really excited to teach this material to you, so let's just dive right into it. Biostatistics is a branch of statistics that applies research methods to a wide range of topics in both biology and clinical sciences. It comes from a combination of the words biology, meaning study of life, and statistics, which is the practice or science of collecting and analyzing data. I want to start with PICO, which is a fundamental building block of clinical research. The acronym PICO is a framework often used in evidence-based practice to formulate research questions and to guide systematic searches for relevant studies. A good clinical question should cover these four areas. The first is P, which defines the specific population or patient group being studied or the specific problem or condition being addressed. I defines the intervention being considered, usually a treatment, a diagnostic test, or some exposure. C specifies the alternative compared to the intervention, which could be a different treatment, a placebo, or no treatment at all, which we would call the control. Typically, the I is some newer, innovative treatment or test being compared with an older, more established, or gold standard type treatment or diagnostic test. And O is the outcome, the desired effect from the intervention, which could be a clinical outcome, a patient-reported outcome, or a health-related outcome. At the bottom is an example of a research question based on a clinical situation that you may encounter. In adults with chronic periodontitis, does laser therapy compared to scaling and root planing lead to a greater reduction in pocket depth and improvement in clinical attachment level? In this example, the P is adults with chronic periodontitis. The I is laser therapy, the C is scaling and root planing, and the O is reduction in pocket depth and improvement in clinical attachment level. This PICO question is clear, specific, and covers all four areas, guiding the researcher to focus on a well-defined clinical question. The finer criteria is a set of guidelines used to evaluate the quality of a research question. Each letter in this acronym stands for a different criterion. So these five attributes are essential to ensure that a research question is not only well-constructed, which the PICO framework figured out, but is also capable of driving a study that's both meaningful and impactful. And that's where the finer criteria come in. So F stands for feasible. The study should be realistic and manageable, considering factors such as time, budget, expertise, equipment, sample size needed, and access to subjects or data. I stands for interesting. Your research should be engaging and hold the interest of the researchers, the clinicians, the target audience, and it should be interesting to you as well. N stands for novel. The study should provide 
new insights or add value to the existing body of knowledge. It could involve new treatments, methods, or investigate new populations. E stands for ethical. The research must comply with ethical standards, ensuring that participants are not exposed to any harm, that their rights are protected, and that informed consent is always obtained. All papers involving human subjects must be reviewed and approved by the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, before being published. And the R stands for relevant. The research question should address a significant problem or knowledge gap and be relevant to clinical practice, policy development, or further research. Let's take a look at another research question and apply the finer criteria to it. So does daily use of an herbal mouthwash reduce the incidence of gingivitis in adults more effectively than a standard antiseptic mouthwash over a period of six months? So of course, we also could apply our PICO framework here. We have our P, which is adults. The I is an herbal mouthwash. The C is the standard antiseptic mouthwash. And O is the reduction in the incidence of gingivitis over a period of six months. But can this paper also be meaningful and impactful? So let's go through these five. Feasible. This study could be conducted in a dental clinic with a suitable number of patients as long as both mouthwash types are available. So that seems pretty realistic. Interesting. It appeals to both researchers and clinicians interested in non-chemical alternatives for oral health. So that sounds pretty good too. Novel. It explores the efficacy of an herbal product, adding to the limited research on natural remedies and dentistry. So that sounds pretty good as well. Ethical. Well, the study poses minimal risk to participants, and we would assume that it includes standard safety and informed consent procedures, so we can mark that one as well. And then relevant. The findings could certainly influence clinical recommendations and patient preferences for oral hygiene products, depending on the results. So that sounds good as well. So by using the finer criteria, researchers can ensure that their study is well-designed, meaningful, and capable of contributing valuable information to the field. Next, I want to talk about the research hypothesis. A hypothesis is a specific, testable statement about the expected outcome of a study. So a research hypothesis provides a focus for the study and guides the data collection and analysis. It has two forms, though. We have a null form and an alternative form. So the null form proposes that there is no effect relationship or difference between two or more groups being studied. And it serves as the starting point for statistical testing and assumes that any observed differences are due to random chance rather than a true effect or relationship. So let's go through the question here below. Here's another research question. Does application of fluoride varnish every three months reduce the incidence of dental caries in children between 6 and 12 years old more effectively than fluoride toothpaste used daily? Now, if you want some extra practice, go ahead and pause the video and write out the PICO framework and the finer criteria for this question. But with regards to the null hypothesis, we would state it as follows. The application of fluoride varnish every three months does not reduce the incidence of dental caries in children aged 6 to 12 more effectively than fluoride toothpaste used daily. So the null hypothesis asserts that there is no difference in the effectiveness of varnish and toothpaste in reducing dental caries with these parameters and in this specific population. 
The alternative form, by contrast, proposes that there is an effect, relationship, or difference between two or more groups being studied. So going back to this example, the alternative hypothesis could be children aged 6 to 12 who receive fluoride varnish applications every three months will have a lower incidence of dental caries over a 12-month period compared to children who use fluoride toothpaste daily. And I just used 12 months as an arbitrary test period. But the research hypothesis clearly states the expected outcome, which would be lower incidence of dental caries, and also specifies the groups being compared, the children receiving fluoride varnish versus the ones using fluoride toothpaste. The hypothesis is testable as data can be collected and analyzed to determine if the predicted difference actually exists. Really, really important to understand the ins and outs of the hypothesis and its different forms. We'll definitely cover this in more detail when we talk about statistical significance later in this series. And lastly, I want to review the anatomy of a research paper. Because a well-structured research paper typically follows a standard format with several key sections, each serving a unique purpose. It's important to know this information for the board exam in case they ask you about the reason for a specific section of a research paper. So the title is a concise statement that summarizes the main topic or findings of the research. The title should be informative and specific, giving readers a clear idea of the paper's content. It might even outright state the study design of the paper, like a randomized control trial, which we'll review all of those later in the series. The research question from two slides ago might have the title, Effectiveness of Herbal Mouthwash in Reducing Gingivitis, a Randomized Controlled Trial. The abstract is a brief summary of the research paper, usually between 150 and 250 words. It includes the background, objectives, methods, results, and conclusions of the study. The abstract allows readers to quickly understand the study's purpose and key findings. How I think of it is the title summarizes the paper in a few words, while the abstract summarizes the paper in a few sentences. The introduction is a bit different. It provides background information on the research topic, outlines the problem being addressed, reviews relevant literature, and states the research question or hypothesis, usually at the end. The introduction sets the tone, it sets the context, and justifies the need for this study. So for example, going back to that same research paper two slides ago, an introduction might read something like this. Gingivitis is a common inflammatory condition affecting the gums and is often caused by inadequate oral hygiene. Traditional antiseptic mouthwashes are effective, but may cause side effects. This study investigates whether an herbal mouthwash can provide a natural and effective alternative for reducing gingival inflammation. Then after that, we could cite some other research papers that investigated previously the effectiveness of certain mouthwashes, and then ultimately we would end that introduction with a clear statement of our research hypothesis. The methods section, also sometimes called the materials and methods, describes how the study was conducted, including details about the study design, participants, materials, procedures, and data analysis methods. The methods section should be detailed enough for others to replicate the study. It's very, very important that the methods section doesn't leave anything out that would be critical to know in order for other investigators to replicate that exact study design. The results section presents the findings of the study, including data on primary and secondary outcomes. The results section the results section typically includes tables 
and figures and statistical analyses to summarize the data. The discussion section interprets the results in the context of the research question. It also discusses their implications, compares them with previous studies, and addresses potential limitations and biases. So if the results section presents the findings, the discussion section interprets those findings and tells the reader what they mean. The discussion should also suggest areas for further research. The conclusion section summarizes the main findings and their significance, providing a clear answer to the research question. The conclusion may also offer recommendations based on the study's findings. The references section lists all of the sources cited in the paper, formatted according to a specific citation style. The references section ensures that credit is given to previous work and provides readers with resources for further reading. There are also some optional sections. For example, the acknowledgments section is where the researchers recognize individuals, institutions, and funding sources that contributed to the research but did not write the paper. And appendices can contain some supplementary material that is just too detailed to have in the main text, like really big tables with lots of information or questionnaires that were given to the research participants. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you want to go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you want to join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.